this has just dropped. The A6700, this is going to be a really good video because I'm gonna be comparing it against the FX30. Now, they share the exact same sensor, that 26 megapixel, beautiful new sensor that's capable of filming up to 120 frames per second. And I've put the FX30 into a whole bunch of different scenarios and shot so many different projects with this thing. So the sensor, I'm very used to, but I've also shot a lot with this A6700 for the past couple of weeks, and I love this camera. And I do have to mention, when it comes to image quality, they are practically the same because they are the same sensor. It's the ergonomics and the usability that makes these two cameras different. But which one is actually better? Which one's better for your money? Which one is going to be suiting your kind of workflow at the end of the day? And that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be comparing these two, seeing what the differences are. And if you haven't got one of these, then which one would you actually choose? Let's get into it. So the Sony a6700 is an APS-C camera with a 26 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor that's capable of filming up to 4K at 120 frames per second and 240 frames per second in 1080p. It features a brand new 2.36 million dot EVF. It can take 26 megapixel raw stills and has the new AI processing chip for faster and reliable autofocus. It features the Z100 battery, internal IBIS, all in a small compact form factor. And it comes in at about 2,549 Australian dollars, which is about $500 cheaper than the FX30. First of all, we have to talk about, obviously the clear differences on the body, the hardware stuff on the outside first, and then we'll talk about the interior, you know, firmware, software sort of things. So first of all, it is a smaller body, but the one thing that you will notice between these two is that EVF. Now, a lot of people think that the FX30 needed an EVF, EVF because a lot of cinematographers, videographers like to actually use an EVF when filming. Obviously, photographers love EVFs. Even on bright sunny days, these screens aren't really that bright. So having an EVF can actually help you with that. And this one has it. It is a 2.36 million dot EVF, which is almost blackout free. So if you are in burst mode when it comes to photography, you're not getting any sort of blackout mode, which is really, really good. But we have to talk about obviously that later on when it comes to some of the photography and the internal specs of this thing. Now, one major difference between these two is that this one actually has that mechanical shutter. Now, that is the difficult thing about the FX30 is that it doesn't have that mechanical shutter. But for the main thing is that this is tailored towards video people. And this one is a hybrid camera. So you will get a lot of people that want these for stills when it comes to photography with um, sports, wildlife, and all those kind of things that you know you need this for. That mechanical shutter is going to be you know really, really good because you're not gonna get any sort of rolling shutter artifacts when it comes to photography. Now, one of the biggest things that I love about this and that it is on the a7 IV is that dial switch at the top here where you can switch it from photo to video to SNQ. That is great, especially like I said, for hybrid shooters who actually wanna utilize photo and video, quickly switch between that and also keep your settings saved in the photo mode and then you switch over to video and all your video settings are still saved there. So it makes it so much easier if you are a hybrid shooter this is really good. Plus, you've still got that dial on the top, which gives you that one, two, and three custom modes. So essentially, you've got nine different custom buttons, obviously three each, three for photo, three for video, and three for SMQ, which is amazing. Now, when it comes to that mode button, yes, the FX30 does have it, but it's just a mode button, and you've got the three custom things in there, so it's not a quick switch on the top, so it is a little bit slower to get into, but you know, like I said, this is predominantly for video shooters and if you do want to switch into you know 100 frames 50 frames you just quickly hit that mode go into your m1 m2 or m3 now i guess one of the big determining factors about this one is obviously dual sd card slot in the fx30 versus a single SD card slot in this. Now the FX30 does take that type A card as well as the SD card. So you've got a lot more versatility when it comes to that. Whereas this one has that single SD card slot, which I know a lot of people still use two SD cards. I personally only use one SD card. Well, pretty much all type A cards now, they're extremely reliable. But obviously in these bodies, you've only got SD cards. You have to make sure you purchase really reliable SD cards. And uh, 
Prograde are generally the ones that I go for when it comes to these. And I guess at the end of the day with that, that could be a bit of a downside and a big determining factor whether someone's not going to be purchasing this and going for this one instead. Now ergonomically, what I like about what they've added in the A6700 is the front dial and obviously the rear dial. So you can actually do aperture, shutter speed, and then ISO down the bottom, which is pretty much the same as the FX30. So it is a good and welcomed feature that I know a lot of people are actually going to like with that one. Now also one of the major things about this is that it is a smaller body than this. And that's obviously because of the fan. So the fan is the one thing that, you know, gives you a bit more assurance when it comes to longer record times, you know, hotter climates. This one, it could come down to overheating, but I've done a few overheating tests and it's really, really good. I'm surprised by how long this actually lasts. In a regular 24 degree room, I got well over an hour in 4K25. And then when I've switched it to 4K100, I actually got about 20 minutes straight recording, which who records more than 15 to 20 seconds in 4K100 anyway? Uh, so overheating tests, actually, it did perform quite well. But this one, you know, it does give you that assurance when it comes to long record times. And if you do have these for interviews, I wouldn't have any issues using this as an A cam or a B cam. Whereas this one, you would think, ah, is it gonna overheat? But hey, if you're filming in incredibly uncomfortable heats and you're trying to interview someone, <laughs> You should probably fix your interview location first. Now, externally, that's pretty much it from this one. And this is where the FX30 takes over because there's so much more on this body. And namely, tally lights. Tally lights are really good when it comes to videography because you've got on the front, you've got on the back, and then you've got obviously the screen uh, that's, you know, when you press record, big box around the screen. I mean, this does have that big box around the screen, but doesn't have, you know, your front uh, LED and the back LED tally light. Now, one of the big major differences happens to be these mounting points on the FX30. This actually allows you to have that XLR top handle and screw it directly in here. So if you do like to use that XLR top handle and obviously have XLR inputs, then that is big. That's a massive difference. But you can still get the XLR K3M as well, which you know plugs into the top of the MI shoe and you can put um, your XLR inputs into there but you don't have it you know, screwed into the body. Now this obviously gives it a little bit more mounting points if you do want to mount it on car rigs or mount it on a whole bunch of other different accessories to try and you know, make this a solid camera and stop it from moving around inside your rig. So there is a little bit more versatility with this style of body. Now one of the minor things that I do like is the record button on top. It's nice and big, but then also it's this front one because a lot of times I've got my hand on the top handle and then other hand on the lens zooming or focusing and I want to hit record and all I got to do is actually just try and you know position my fingers so I can actually press this front record button which is really good especially if you are trying to you know be in the field and trying to record really fast as opposed to trying to hold the camera you know touch record put it back on the top hand or so those little things actually does make a difference when you are on a fast set. Now, one thing that I don't use very often, but I know a lot of people do when it comes to documentary or weddings and all that kind of stuff, is that zoom rocker. This one obviously has a zoom rocker, whereas the A6700 doesn't have a zoom rocker. So if you are into those power zoom lenses, the FX30 is going to be your best bet there. And another really small thing is that sort of control nipple on the top here. So if you do want to control your autofocus points, or even if you're, you know, doing critical zooming and you just want to try and move it, you have to, you can use that top thing. Whereas this one, you've only got that D-pad on the back. So a little bit different, but you know, is quite handy if you do like that. Now, internally, this is where things change a little bit because like I said, in standard Sony style, they like to throw all the great latest and greatest features in their newest cameras. And this has that AI processing chip out of the A7R5 and also the ZV-E1. And that chip actually gives you so much more versatility when it comes to autofocus. So you can focus on obviously your birds, insects, planes, trains, cars, all those kind of things. It gives you so much more that you can actually focus on, which can be really handy when it comes to photography and videography. Now that AI processing chip actually does one massive interesting thing 
that I only just found out a couple of days ago, and that is auto reframing. And they actually brought this in the ZVE1, and that's essentially you put the camera down and you hit auto framing. You can choose three different sizes, how much it wants to crop in, and you can move around the frame and it will actually crop in in camera. So this is the auto reframing right now. So essentially, it's just one of those cool features that if you don't know how to do this in post-production, it does it in camera. So it's really quick turnover. It's literally, you record it and it's right there for you. So you don't have to fiddle around with it, try and track yourself in post-production. It's just one of those things that, you know, you don't really use it that much, but if you have it and you don't need it, then that's cool. But if you need it and don't have it, then it's kind of like, ah, damn it. So yeah. It's not bad. And the great thing that I actually love about that on this sensor, it's a 26 megapixel sensor. So it's a 6K sensor that down samples to 4K. So you're not going to lose any resolution because you've got so much more resolution already to start off with. You're gonna actually be pumping out a nice clean 4K image when uh, it actually spits out that image onto the card. So that is a massive plus with this sensor. Now there is a smaller feature in here with video self timer. So it's kind of like, you know, when you try and take a photo and put a timer down, you hit the button, quickly run into the spot and wait, you know, five to 10 seconds, however you've timed it. And then it starts taking a photo. But you know, this one, exactly the same. You put it down, you wait five to 10 seconds and it will start recording. So, I mean, that's kind of cool for people who do like to record themselves and don't want to, you know, have that little bit at the start but much of a muchness there. It just uh, gives you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to recording. And also when it comes to uh, video time-lapse, it does video time-lapse internally, which is you know really cool. And we saw in the ZV-E1 as well, but you can kind of do very similar when it comes to S and Q mode, all the way down to one frame per second. So it's much of a muchness there. So yeah, really depends. Now, another small one is that swipe across menu. So you can get the two side uh, menus uh, or the swipe up menu, which is your regular function menu. So they did bring that in the ZVE1, which is obviously a good feature to have there. Now, one of the biggest features that I love in this is that mechanical shutter. And that's allowed us to do a little bit better photography. And when it comes to photography, that's where they've added burst mode, which I really, really, really wish they had burst mode in the FX30. But when it comes to this one, it's uh, obviously a hybrid camera. So you're going to be taking a lot of photos. So you can do burst mode in this, which, you know, is a welcomed feature. So good. Look at that. Ah, I love burst mode. That's gonna be really, really good for wildlife and sports photographers with this thing. And that's a great thing about this one as well, is that they've actually said that they've sped up the buffer. So essentially you could hold your finger down and just have continuous shooting, which is incredible. And that's one of the biggest things uh, that Sony have focused on is reducing that buffer rate. Because what they actually said is instead of focusing on Let's try and get 30 frames a second in photography. Let's try and get, you know, a moderate 11 to 12 frames per second, but have zero buffer. So you can actually take photos for a longer period of time as opposed to holding your finger down, 30, 60, 90, 120 frames, and then you're kind of stuck. It just buffers. It's writing to the card, locks up your camera. You can't do anything. So that's a big difference when it comes to sports and wildlife photography. So it really just depends on what you find more valuable to you. And Sony pretty much find it more valuable to have faster buffer speeds as opposed to faster frame rate speeds. Now, when it comes to video, obviously internally, this has anamorphic D squeeze, which was just in that newest firmware update. So you can get a 1.3 times squeeze or a two times D squeeze, obviously in a camera. Now that does turn off the IBIS, but you probably don't want IBIS with anamorphic uh, lenses anyway. But, you know, that is a good sort of feature to have in this. Now, it also does have that uh, massive thing that a lot of people like, and that is that Cine EI workflow. And essentially, Cine EI just allows you to shoot at the two base ISOs and gives you the best performance in terms of dynamic range and uh, just the ability to push and pull the image a lot better, obviously, if you expose correctly for that one. 
And there is also that feature in there that a lot of people like, and that's DCI 4K, where DCI 4K is 1496 by 2160. So it's just a little bit bigger than your regular 3840 by 2160. And this has also brought 24 frames per second with it, true 24 frames, so not your 23.976, it's actual 24 frames per second. Now I do have to mention, when it comes to video recording, the FX30 does have raw recording through the Atomos Ninja 5, Whereas, obviously, the A6700 does not do raw recording. So you're able to get 16-bit linear raw out of the Atomos Ninja 5 into a 12-bit ProRes file. Now, while I don't use this ProRes raw, it is there in case you do need it. So I guess, all in all, if you're a video shooter, I personally would choose the FX30. It just has that fan. It's got a couple of added features that would probably suit most videographers, but that's where the versatility of the A6700 kind of comes in handy because you do have the ability to switch to photos and get really nice 26 megapixel stills. Uh, the video is exactly the same when it comes to capabilities, just no uh, DCI 4K. It doesn't have anamorphic D squeeze, and it also obviously doesn't have that Cine EI workflow, but the ISO performance is the same, the noise performance is pretty much the same, even though Sony did say that the AI processor does actually help uh, this when it comes to noise performance. But overall, if you're a photographer or a hybrid shooter, I personally would choose the A6700. It's kind of like I said, the A74, but it's just a baby APS-C version. And uh, for the price of this thing, man, you're getting such a powerful, powerful little camera. And it probably is one of the best APS-C cameras you can get right now, especially for this price. Anyway, my friends, hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, give it a thumbs up. That would be amazing. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And I'll be doing a comparison against the a7 IV because like I said, this is a baby a7 IV and I cannot wait to compare these two. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one. All right, let's get it.